Well, hi everybody. I think everybody's on now, so uh, let's get started. Um, well, it's May the 25th, 2025. I can't believe how time has flown. Um, and I thought it'd be a good time today to talk about, you know, what we've been seeing in the last few years since the coronavirus pandemic, since the crisis. It's almost five years now, and um, clearly so much has changed. Very little is unchanged um, by what by what's happened. Um, the way we educate children, the way we heal ourselves medically, uh, the way we bank, the way we do everything, the way we entertain ourselves, and clearly perhaps for, first and foremost amongst the things that have changed is the way we work. Uh, clearly kind of virtually and online has become the norm. Travel's the last resort, not the first resort now. I mean, are we surprised that that change has really stuck and, uh, and we're just so routinely and um, normally working like this now? Well, I'm not surprised, Ben, no. When the doors opened after the COVID-19 crisis and we could go back to the office, many employees asked, why would we, when we can so effectively work from home? No, and it turned out that they never went back, right? So the, along came the COVID-19 Big Bang and it sort of vaporized all of these old work from home canards about teleshirking or the fact that you know, there are certain work, supposedly, that could never be done virtually. And so as I remember, the pandemic came along and necessity kind of dictated, get over it, get going and get used to it. And so initially, you know, after some weeks of fumbling around with Zoom rooms and these sort of goofy online cocktail parties, work streams absolutely emerged that were cheaper and faster and of higher quality. We are seeing this big shift towards every home being retrofitted with dedicated home office spaces equipped with soundproofing, separate voice-driven entrances, podcast booths, 3D printers, and ergonomic everything. And people aren't just using these spaces for remote work. They double up as the new social hangouts, the new pub, bar, club. They're a place where we can all meet to connect in virtual reality. COVID was the great equaliser of who could use digital tools. Suddenly we had Zooming grannies teaching TikTok obsessed teenagers how to use house party. Now every generation sees the benefit of maintaining real world relationships inside the machine. We're certainly seeing uh, an environmental benefit from not traveling, not commuting so much. Um, you and I seem to remember you saying that you were going to make a personal commitment not to travel so much in the future on business. How, how's that worked out? How's that going? Yes, it's still going. You know what? I think the virus actually delivered a cosmic message to businesses that they had to change. Business travel went from a high status activity. You know, you went to Sydney for a conference. Wow, that's amazing. To something which is rather embarrassing. You know what? You went to Sydney for a conference. How could you? So yes, like many others around the world, I now question whether I need to fly for a business meeting that can really be done online. If the outbreak and spread of the virus taught us anything, it's how inextricably linked and interconnected and interdependent we truly are, biologically, economically, and environmentally. China sneezed and the whole world got a new Great Depression. Silver linings did emerge, particularly how the economic slowdown that followed changed our frenetic business as usual attitude and prompted us to recalibrate how we live and preserve our blue planet, just like you and. I never thought I'd say this prior to the pandemic, but coronavirus made clean the new cool from Fenty face masks to surgical gloves at Zara and even LVMH special edition hand sanitizer. I've got that laying around the house somewhere still. And seeing the appreciation, not just for medical professionals, but for sanitation workers and cleaning crews, I feel like that is one of the great legacies of this new clean regime. Ben, I know that you've been talking to the HSA. What's the last five years been like for them? Yes, well, that's right. In the months, and, and literally it was months after the, the panic, uh, we saw the creation of the HSA, the, the Health Security Agency, sort of mirroring the creation of the TSA after 9-11. And, and clearly that spread and sort of become ubiquitous, hasn't it? Uh, the airlock... Uh, on every building and having to go through the OK to go scan, that kind of Star Trek tricorder-like scan to go into pretty much every building now, not just a plane, but 
every building. And we see that, you know, everywhere in, in big cities and out in the suburbs, out in the rural areas as well. That's kind of become a, a way of life now. I have to bring up the obvious privacy question here. We're now being scanned everywhere we go. Proponents of health and movement monitoring, like the HSA, argued back then that extraordinary times required extraordinary measures. And the need to stop the virus overruled any misgivings we had around data privacy at the time. But we now opened the floodgates to health, biometric and movement data be being collected at mass. It's hard to see the wood from the trees here. It's 2025 and the HSA is everywhere. Is health monitoring still a sensible precaution five years after the end of COVID? Well, guys, I guess we're out of time and we could talk about this for another five years, clearly, couldn't we? Uh, but hopefully, uh, folks, if they're interested, they can still find our After the Virus report up on our website and um, uh, more examples there of how the world changed after 2020 and how it still continues to change and how the, the effects and the shocks and the implications of what went on then really are still reverberating through uh, every aspect of society and including our work right now. So check that out.